<laughs> well, this is fun. This is a continuous loop. Watching the phone, that's watching the phone, that's watching the phone, that's watching the phone. But that's not why we're here. This took a very long time to pair. Um, longer than I expected. I was finally successful, obviously, because we're watching what I'm recording on the remote, which is the iPhone. So we're going to do a couple of things today. Um, we're doing the quick tip, which um, I've wanted to do for a couple of days, but I've kind of been busy here in the shop. But we're also going to be doing the quick tip with a wake bait in a pumpkin seed. So I'm going to just show you how one of, one of the many ways that I put on the pumpkin seed detail to allure. So let's get started. Okay, so for our first quick tip of the day, a uh, couple of basics. There are some different types of materials that you can use um, that are relatively inexpensive to use in everyday layering and techniques in your spraying. So when you have a lure, for example, this is a wake bait that we have sprayed already. I'm going to try and bring it into your view. This has got a base coat on it. It's got our yellow and uh, I believe this is a sunset orange underneath. It's a, actually, they call it a pineapple iridescent. And it kind of fades up into a little bit of brown and then just a little bit of purple on top. We've sprayed this with a Createx Caribbean Blue on the cheeks. And we have just a little bit more Caribbean Blue in the back. Just enough to accent it. But now we're ready to layer our bait. And we want to make it look like a pumpkin seed, like, a, like the panfish would look like, as close to nature as we can get it. And one of the cool things that you can do, you can pick these, these up at Walmart, this is craft ribbon. Now it's got a little bit of glitter and uh, if you're just picking this up for the first time you'll notice that it is going to shed some glitter as you go. Now that necessarily is not a bad thing. Um, you can, a lot, a lot of folks put glitter on their baits after they're done. kind of represents the, the texturing and, and layering that you would find in nature on a fish. But um, we've cut a little section here and what we want to do is we're going to make it look just like this one. So in order to do that, we've got some alligator clips and I think in the, uh, the studio tour, the last studio session video that I did with you guys, um, I showed you that you could get these at Amazon. I always link these in the description below. You can get alligator clips, you can get these cool things which are helping hands. Um, those come in, no pun intended, really handy especially when you're doing a large run, like what we have set up for this weekend. Um, but the alligator clips come just, you know, loose like this in a container of 50, or you can get 100 in a batch. And what you want to do, and uh, you can see that I've used this one before because it's sort of contoured to a, a wake bait. You're going to set this, just kind of lay it over the top of your bait. And you want to pull that down as tightly as you can. And once you've taken and put that uh, over the back eyelet, you want to just set your alligator clip in place just to hold it steady. And then you want to go ahead and stretch the front of this out as well. And you can see that it's now the, just poking through this mesh. And this is a fabric mesh. And it's pretty tough. I mean, I've used, I've been using this, uh, the same one for, gosh, probably a month or so now. And they do hold up relatively well. They don't cover the entire bait unless you have something very thin like a, a popper or a jerk bait. Um, but these do really well because on the pumpkin seeds, a lot of the time the belly is just kind of plain or it has a, just a, a little bit of the reference of the modeled complexion there. And you want to just kind of fold these over the ears. Now that you have your alligator clips on both sides, we're going to add this to the bill on one side and then we're going to do the same on the other. And you want as tight of a seal as possible on this because you're going to be spraying right over top of this. So you want to kind of put your finger on here, pinch that down 
just pull as tight as you can. Take an alligator clip and then take another alligator clip and just keep going down the back side, the under, underside of this bait until you have a nice tight seal to where when you spray, and you'll see that in a second, when you spray, it's not going to be loose and it's not going to shoot on either side. This is going to tightly form to the plastic on the side of this bait. And then we're going to take some tangerine iridescent orange, some pearlized, deep, like a, almost like a burnt orange, and we're going to layer that onto this bait as well. So now you can see we have two of these pretty much set up the same. And let's spray them. Now as we go down the list of things that need to happen on the rest of this bait to get it to look the way we want it to look, first color we're going to load into the chamber on the overlay on the actual pumpkin seed portion of this is this, Crea I'm using Createx today, it's a pearlized pearl tangerine. Nice and bright. Um, it, it shows up really well against the uh, the colors that are on this bait. Um, and you also want to you want to test to make sure that that's coming out the way you want it to. Now this is coming out real fast and we don't need to spray it real fast so we're going to turn our PSI down to about Let's see, get it down right about 15. About 15 PSI for this overlay. And then we're just going to go evenly. We're going to move this, move our hand. We're going to keep the, the bait as still as possible, but I don't want it on the alligator clip only because I have a little bit more freedom to move this bait the way I want it with my wrist instead of just kind of trying to turn it on the alligator clips on the helping hands. So just in a... back and forth motion and then we come around and do the overlay on the top you always want to move it you don't want to angle it on this because you really just want it to set in on the inside of where this is being created for you do the same thing on this side as well A little bit on the front. Just get a nice coating on there. We're going to set to the to, excuse me, set to, <laughs> I need more coffee. Set this to the side. I knew I could speak English. We're going to do the same thing. Might need a little bit more paint with this one. And just see how my hand's moving nice and steady. Back and forth. out. So I'm just going to load a little bit more of this pearl tangerine in the chamber. This is an Iwata Eclipse. Very durable. This is the workhorse of the, uh, the airbrush communities. You do the same thing right here. Just bring that down. Now we're not going to heat set this because we are going to be blending just a little bit in. We want, we want that nice heavy layer in there. And then we're going to, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to dump the rest of this off, clean the chamber, and then we're going to add a little bit of Createx yellow, a little bit of Createx. This is an Ozark green. This is a color that I've mixed. I pre -mix a few of the colors that I use on a regular basis. If I want to change the tint just a little bit, I've added uh, probably about 7% gray and a, a little bit of uh, brown in this. So this isn't exactly the way Createx made this. Uh, this would have been a leaf green. I do keep the leaf green back there. And I also keep the transparent orange. My basic colors I usually keep pretty big bottles of because that's the stuff that I'm mixing with. I do a lot of mixing when I paint, um, but just uh, just to know that's not the color as, uh, as it came out of the bottle. It's been messed with a little bit. So let's clean this chamber out 
and uh, let's get our yellow in. All right, we have this Createx Bright Yellow. I always want to shake it a little bit since I'm wearing my camera. We're shaking a little bit together. Pour this in. Don't want a whole lot of that on either bait. This is just an accent color. Now, because I have a lot of different patterns, I know one of the questions that I get asked often is, how do you keep your colors straight? How do you remember how to mix these things together and do the same thing twice? Well, pictures help, and you'll have to pardon the, uh, the low ink on this one. Um, but if I have some sort of reference point, and I do the same thing, you can see that um, if I raise the camera just a little bit, you can see the crayfish back there. I use reference photography uh, for painting from canvases, and I also use it for painting lures because that way I can go right back to the source and say, hey, this bait looked like this. Um, so it, you're going to get a little bit of color variation just because this is not an imaged bait. This is a hand, you know, hand cut, hand tailored, hand sprayed um, lure. So there might be some slight variation, but uh, usually the colors are, are pretty close. So if we're looking at that, and I've got my yellow, the only place, now again, this is, this is an ink line from the printer, so just ignore that, is in the tail. So we're just going to run a little bit of this yellow. Just real easy in the back. And again, it's not a whole lot just to cover the back. And do the same thing with the other bait since we're doing two. I always find if I'm doing more than one bait at a time, it's much, much easier to set these up to where I have enough paint in the chamber to do it on both. So you can see that's just a little bit of yellow detail in there on both of the back sides of this. Again, we don't want to spoil this orange. The orange is the color that's really going to pop out off of this bait. Um, but just a little bit of accenting because the, you will see a color fade in nature. Um, and you will also see a lot of contrasting colors like blue on orange. They're opposite ends of the color spectrum on, or the color wheel if you will. There we go. Just kind of blow the rest. There wasn't a whole lot of paint in that chamber. So we just kind of blow that off. Add a little bit of green. Get that flowing, and then just a touch over top of the yellow, just just a tiny bit. Really don't need much of the green at all. Okay, and that's pretty much it. So the only thing that we need to do now is heat set, and then I'm going to add the accenting around the eyes. We're going to set in the eyes, and then I'm going to show you what the bait looks like after it's already been clear coated. Heat set. All right. Heat set both of these. And uh, one, one of the mistakes that I made when I started painting, first started out, was that I would remove the layer or whatever sort of fabric I was using before I would dry it. That's a big no-no. Paint will smear. It's not going to look as good um, as it's going to look if you heat set first. And you just want to kind of peel that back and you can see immediately what that looks like. How cool is that? You guys see that? And we'll set this under a better light once we're finished so that you guys can take a good look at that. This is just a beautiful, beautiful type of uh, pumpkin seed. There's a lot of different methods and techniques on doing the pumpkin seeds. This is one of about five or six that I use, and I, I pick up tips from other artists as well. But uh, like I said in the uh, shop tour, you really want to try and make something that's uniquely yours. Um, it's... It, it's very easy to copy or mimic somebody else's work, but if you can turn that in to something that is just you and you alone, then that's super cool. So we just kind of want to peel the top off of that. I'll bring that down a little bit so you guys can see it. And you can see that 
from the opposite color, the blue and the orange, really, really set off one another. You've got that little fade in the back, same thing. And this is just sort of like an accuracy check. You know, you've got a little bit of purple up top and it fades down into that brown yellow. And it looks pretty good on the bottom too. It looks pretty natural. It doesn't look like there's any lines or anything that we're going to need to touch up. Although it is pretty easy to touch these things up, but I don't think we're going to need to on these. Well, there we go. Now the next step is going to be just kind of filling in a little bit of shading, dark shading. Sometimes I'll use a a wicked deep blue. This is a super dark blue. Can even add like one or two drops of black into that and get it a little bit darker, but I'll, I'll use it as it is. And then sometimes I'll just use the transparent black and just kind of haze that onto the eye area just to give it a little bit of definition to make that eye stand out once it goes in because we're going to be using red eyes on this. All right. Let's load the chamber with some black. All right, now that we have, now that we've used this and we no longer have a need for it, I like to kind of clean as I go. And just to give you an idea of all the residual, this started out being white and is now very clearly yellow and orange. So if you're doing a lot of baits in succession, if you're going to be spraying for a period of time, and you don't need to talk to a camera. Um, make sure, number one, that your room is well ventilated. A lot of people put up little boxes where they have like a bathroom fan and they'll just kind of shoot that air away from them so they're not breathing in the... Now this is water-based paint, which is helpful. It's not a solvent-based. Um, but still, wear, wear a respirator, folks. Be smart about it. You don't want any junk in your lungs. We got both of these here. There we go. And you can see I started with a couple of drops of blue. Let's see if the camera can pick that up. And I put a couple of drops of black. And that's also, uh, it, it's a little trade secret. If you want to blend colors on your lures, that's an easy way to do it. And you put your, your lighter color on the bottom and you fill a couple of drops of either shading or darker color up top and that will give you a much smoother transition when you're blending colors. Trial by error. You learn things. So we're just gonna lightly add that in. And then There you go. We've got that shading going on right there. Same thing on the other base. You just barely need to pull the trigger down on that. Now we're well shaded. We're ready for some eyes. I'm going to heat set this real quick off camera. Come back in. We're going to inset our eyes and we're going to clear coat this. Okay, we have finished the overlay part. Now, I wasn't going to go through the entire process on this particular video. I, I will certainly do a separate pumpkin seed video, but I really wanted to concentrate more on how to get the patterns in because you guys have asked about stenciling, you've asked about different types of materials that I use to do that mesh overlay and to do different things, the scaling. Um, so one of the things that uh, that I want to impress upon you is how readily available things are. You don't even necessarily have to get online. You don't have to have an account online. You can save money if you're young. You can pretty much go to like a Hobby Lobby or a Michaels, uh, any of the arts and crafts, even Joanne Fabrics, or Walmart if you have a super center in your, in your neighborhood and they have a craft center. This is where half of the stuff that I use comes from and I would imagine if, if you're a, an airbrush artist out there, you've probably explored that and if you haven't, go check it out because um, there's some pretty cool stuff available. So stuff like this. Now this is very thin. Um, I would imagine we would be wrapping this. I, I haven't really played around with this. I just kind of picked it up because it looked neat. Um, but it's very similar to this stuff. 
I'll show you what it is. This came from, this is floral ribbon made by Offre and available at Walmart in the craft section. So you've got a couple of different things there. Obviously we use that today. This material, also very cool. This stuff came from a three pound bag of red potatoes. So you can even find materials and fabric if you get a good look at that, if, I don't know if the camera's gonna focus on that. But this can be used as a pretty cool scaling pattern as well. The trick is making sure you have these little guys, these helping hand alligator clips, to get that real tight against your bait. Because if you don't have whatever you're using against that lure as tight as you can get it, it's gonna kinda spray underneath and you're gonna kinda get that ghosting effect where you really don't want that most of the time. If you want a really good scale pattern, you want whatever type of layer you're using, any type of meshing, to be as tight as you can possibly get it onto that bait. It's gonna look like doo-doo if you don't. This stuff is called Pelon Wonderweb. This is also available. I've got this at my local Walmart as well. Um, when you guys see my hot tuna um, pattern, this is the kind of stuff that I'm using. I've even heard, now I haven't used it myself, but I've even heard that you can use dryer sheets if you can get that tight onto a bait. So there's just a multitude of things. This is just regular fabric netting. This stuff makes excellent scaling. So just go to a craft section, go play around, um, go explore, go find unique stuff that you can use on these baits. And I'm sure you'll come up with some really kick butt patterns. So the next step is putting some eyes on these. I do want to finish the process with you guys today on this. Oh yeah, almost forgot about this. This is sitting right by, and this is just a different color, uh, the Offre ribbon. But again, you, you kind of got to watch that stuff if you want to kind of slough off the, the glitter that's on top of it, because you will get glitter the first six or seven times you spray with these, uh, with these floral ribbons. And it's, a, it's like a wire, it's got a wire edge on it. It's a hard wire edge, and you can see that right here, and then fabric. But this, this stuff is just super cool. I love using different things. And this is the, the, the scene. And this is a metallic mesh silver, six inches wide and eight yards. Um, I use this on a lot of patterns as well. And this is available online at Amazon and probably other places as well. I just get mine off of uh, Amazon.com. And when you're cutting that stuff, looks like this. This gives you a very cool pattern. And I'm sure you've seen uh, Michael Ornstein use it and some of the, the really accomplished, really legendary airbrush artists out there. So. Let's get to putting these eyes on. All right, we've now come to the part of making this complete where I wanna take the tape off. Now, before I go any further, I do any of the little detailing. I'm gonna put my initials on the bottom like I normally do. We're gonna inset the eyes. I don't wanna have to mess with ripping tape off or anything that's gonna mess this bait up when I'm putting the eyes on because I do use a little bit of this Loctite glue. So we're going to go ahead and take, well, this is just a, a general purpose masking tape. You can use painter's tape. Masking tape does the same thing, and it's about half the price. Because um, you don't have to worry about not pulling tape or pulling paint off the tape. You, you want every last bit of that paint to come up. So we'll just take that off real quick. And we're going to set our eyes in. Well, there's a lot of different eyes out there. For this particular one, I like to use red eyes. The, uh, a lot of the panfish family you'll find either has a yellowish red or red or bright yellow eye. you find it in nature. A lot of the bluegill family just has red eyes. And you're saying, hey, but the, uh, the side fins aren't on yet. Nope. That's actually the very last step because we're masking a part of the area 
that we need. So we will be putting on, just as that's the last thing that we do before we clear coat, is add in that little side, that little black fin. Call that the ear flap. We're just going to use some basic red eyes for this because you really want the eyes to, to show up. It's a little bit small. We use the bigger version of these. We have the next size up. That was pretty much just to make sure that I'm going to be using the correct size. I believe this is a size that's size seven. Yeah. I have a great big chocolate lab girl that's in love with the three-legged cat of the house. Both were rescues and they get along famously. Molly Brown is the lab and Hops is the kitty. We have our eyes. Hey girl! You want to say hi to everybody? What you doing? Yeah, hey Molly Brown. Alright, let me finish this video. And we're going to add just a tiny drop. Usually don't even have to squeeze this. And I do mean tiny. You really, this little goes a long way with this Loctite. And you don't want too much on there. Number one, I firmly believe that anything that can change the chemical compound in KBS diamond strength is not good. Whether it's extra junk on the lure, if you have a little bit of wet paint, whether it's Loctite super glue that's still a little bit tacky or wet, um, certainly air. There's stuff that you can get that's called bloxygen or paint saver. KBS puts out a paint saver in a can that you can use as well. Um, but the diamond, I, I will not use anything but the one part epoxies. It's just so much easier. And as long as you store it correctly, it's going to last and last for you. And I am a true believer in KBS. I'm not sponsored to say that in any means, but I am a proponent and I like to kind of give kudos to the things that work well. When you learn how to use something the right way and it works, there's no reason not to say that it works. KBS works. And it's rock hard. It doesn't yellow like a lot of the two-part, two-ton epoxies do. And we've got those red eyes on there now. And while we're sitting here at the station, I use a Uniball. It's a Vision Elite pardon the junk on my hands, it's there every day. Every day I paint. It does come off. So we're just going to add the initials in. And this is waterproof, so it doesn't smear. Um, some people have written their initials in Sharpie. Um, that does have a tendency to bleed a little bit when you get the paint. But this, not only does it write well on the paint, but it dries very fast and it's waterproof. So, just to show you, let's see if we can get this up here. Get decent light on this. Now you can see what this bait looks like. That's just a sharp looking sharp looking pumpkin seed. One of my favorites to date that I do. It's not like anybody else's pattern yet. I'm sure somebody will. And that's cool. If you guys want to copy this and use it, uh, I really don't have a problem. I wouldn't be teaching you guys if I didn't. So by all means, experiment, learn how to do it. And you can see that that was on there very tight. you don't have that bleed, bleed through or ghosting. I call it ghosting. You have a little bit of color blending back here and you've got your blue cheeks. Looks like pumpkin seed. All right, we're going to spray on the ear flaps. 
on both sides, detail those, get it in clear coat. Okay, next step, and pretty much the final step of our paint procedure here with these. I've got them lined up in a row. I've got white protective sheet underneath of them. And this, this is a hand cut stencil. I use an X-Acto knife. I have a couple of them that I keep around. Make sure that your blades are always sharp. And I've just cut out a little piece of cardboard. It's a thin cardboard. It's the backing from the hooks that I use. I think I've shown you guys that before. And let's do something real quick teach you guys a little trick here. So one thing about these, when you're learning control with the triggers in an air gun, you want to kind of play with, you know, if you can get it coming out that thin, you know, you can do a whole lot of stuff. So you want to go as thin as possible and then just gradually pull that trigger back. You really don't need a whole lot of pressure for this because this is going to shade itself as you go. And you just work with a piece of paper. And the same can be applied to any stencil. And you lift that up and it looks like that. And there's your ear flap. And we're going to detail that by hand afterwards with some white. We're going to come back with a, a very thin tipped brush. Air, um, not an airbrush, but an actual paintbrush that I use for detailing. And just practice. Practice control. And you can also practice on what your stencils are going to look like. Now you see, now when I run that through with wet paint, you're going to get a smear. So that's, again, that's something else that you have to learn. But going back to controlling the pressure at which this stuff comes out, I've got this cranked way down, right about 10. I'm going to keep my hands over this. As I do this, and I'm going to kind of back off and then I'm going to peel this up. I'm not going to slide it like I did on the paper. That was just to show you what it can do while it's wet. You see it smears right there. But now we have a perfect little, and it, if you look at a picture of a fish, that ear flap usually is either straight out or goes up a little bit on the body. So the ear flap kind of points to the top of the, the back of the fish. We'll set that aside. We do one side at a time and since we have a second bait we just set that next next bait down. Line it up. Now you can see that there's a, a defined curve and gill plate on this wake bait. So you want to line it up with that. Set your stencil back down. And you see, you see how I've backed off a little bit? Because if you're using low pressure, it's not going to atomize and come rushing out of the airbrush as quickly as if you had like 20, 30, 40 PSI. And there, you have a perfect little ear flap. I'm going to turn the bait over. The gill plate also kind of protects the drying paint on that side as well. I'll set that off to the side. Now, it's cardboard, so you're not going to get a ton of uses out of it, but you kind of want to just pull off, see how that's pulling off any excess wet paint or tacky paint, because you have to set this down. You're going to flip this over, just like you had it this way on the other side. Now we're going to flip it over, so you got to make sure that the paint that you were just spraying is dry. It's not going to stick to this bait. Line that up with the gill plate. I was talking a little bit earlier about reference photography, reference photos, and I think in the, um, in the workshop tour video that I talked to you guys a little bit about having field study reference guides or looking at pictures online because that's going to show you where your lateral line is. And generally, on these fish, the lateral line is above this little ear, they call it an ear flap, it's not an ear flap, it's just the little tiny fin that protrudes beyond the gill plate. Um, but it sits below that lateral line and on this bait the lateral line is right here. It goes down the whole side of the bait. 
So you want that ear flap below your lateral line. And again, align it right at the edge of that gill plate. Use your fingers to keep that stencil down. And then just lightly spray. And there's your ear flap, folks. There you have it. Good to go. Now all we need is the detailing. Just a real quick heat set. I mean, you can pretty much, if you can spray with nothing coming out, you can almost air dry this. There's really not a whole lot of paint to it. And sometimes if I'm in a hurry or I'm doing a lot, I'll just let the air shoot up. You really have to have control though. If you're just learning control, I don't recommend doing it that way. Um, I'd recommend it taking it to a heat gun or if you're using a hair dryer. I use a Conair hair dryer. Um, I have no issues. But because there's that little amount of paint, just the air coming out of here, it'll, it'll blow it dry in no time. You always want to remember to clean out that chamber once you finish spraying. Now I'm going to come back and clean this off much better once the video is finished. But for the time being, we're going to come right back to this. Now I've got some paint on my hands. I just keep a, I keep a rag. And you can see this is a well-used rag. It's got tons of paint from the chamber over the months. And I wash it. You can wash this. Um, airbrush paint, while it is water-based, usually once it's dry, it's there to stay. And I've ruined, just make sure you don't have on good shirts when you're working with this stuff. So now, what we want to do is we want to get a little tiny, thin, detail brush. And I thought that I had one over here. But apparently, it's over here. So, you can see how thin this is. And this takes a little bit of practice as well. Um, one thing that you might want to do that I would recommend is, if you are just starting out and you're practicing putting your stencil pattern down on paper, practice your detailing behind it. So, instead of ruining baits and trying to get your hand steady, just come by and do your detailing on practice paper. I'm not even going to waste a, a liquid cup for this. I use opaque white. As a matter of fact, I should probably shake this up because white has a tendency to separate. Man, it's taken forever to find a decent base white. It's one of the few colors that I think most airbrushers have difficulty with. Um, testers, there's, uh, there's a few companies out there that are pretty decent, but this is, we're just going to use a couple of drops, just lay that on our crappy paper, I always try and clean up as I go. So what I'm talking about here, let me get you a little bit closer, just kind of roll the edge of that, and then if you're working on detail, just practice putting that edge in. Right? And then you want to put that dot as well. So that once you practice that a few times, it's going to get a little bit easier for you. I don't know if the camera is going to focus enough to be able to see that. But I'm just going to go ahead and move this out of the way since I have some wet paper now. don't want to smear the bait that we're working on. Get another piece of paper down. I keep stacks of it. Just old paper. This is a menu. Uh, I think it's McAllister's. Good deli. So we're just going to take our paintbrush and then we're going to lightly lay in the edge of this. And when people wonder why custom lures are pricey, it's because you don't have a machine spraying cookie cutter. You don't have plastic shrink wrapped images being stamped onto the baits. And actually, to give imagers credit, there are some custom imagers out there that are phenomenal. So I'm not trying to diss them by any means. But Putting detail on baits 
takes a little bit of work. As if on cue. All right. Then we're going to kind of brush the excess off. I'm not going to wash that yet. I don't want any water taint in that, but we're going to heat set this side real quick and then we're going to come back and do the other side. Okay, we've heat set the first side. Now we're on to the second side. We're just bringing that again. I'm just lightly putting this paintbrush in that white paint. Do one at a time here. And I, I'll put my finger on the back of this bait to steady my hand. I used to have rock steady hands, especially when I was a medic in the army. But I'm not a spring chicken anymore. There we go. A little bit of excess right there. And just come down the bottom of this. And you don't want to apply a whole lot of pressure. You just just want enough pressure to get that white edge onto that ear flap. All right, folks. Let's get you a good shot of this prior to clear coating. I'm gonna clear coat one for you on camera. We've done that before, but I'll do it again. Might as well take you start to finish on the layering and process. We're finished with this. It looks just like this, because that's how we do it. And we're ready to uh, heat set this, clear coat it, and we're done. Okay, folks, this is pre-clear coat. But you just have a really sharp looking pumpkin seed, member of the bluegill family. We're going to clear coat this and then voila, gilly gilly. If I'm going to be working in an area while I've got clear coat going on, you want to get as much air exchange as possible. I've got a vent behind here that runs out this door. This door does not open. It's been sealed. Um, it, it doesn't even serve as a door anymore. So it's a steel door. There's a hole cut in the back of it so that it pulls air in. Another hole cut to draw air out. So there's a very good air exchange going on with this. I can also use it as an air conditioner during the uh, during the summer months because I need it in Arkansas in the Delta whoo it gets hot so here's our Prego spaghetti jar and our two Gilly Gillies looking suspiciously like the website version of the Gilly Gilly got that little bit of pearlized plum on the top fading down into a, a lighter color and that pineapple on the bottom a little bit of chest red that indigo black shading around the eyes and red eyes a lot of people use different things to hang on a drip wire I've got several drip wires set up in the uh, in the studio this is going to be the one that that's obviously when I'm doing a smaller run it's the one I use most frequently but I also have one two three more so I can effectively hang usually the top two is what I'm using so um, I can hang up to about 50, 60 baits. Lordy, I hope I don't ever have to do 50, 60 baits. I'm sure there's some guys out there that have done that many in a day. And uh, you got to just lose your mind. So we're cutting off sections. Well, this is pre-existing, but um, for the purposes of the video, I'll just show you how I do it. Sections of this 25 gauge wire. You pick it up at Walmart. Pick it up at a Home Depot, Lowe's. It's just galvanized steel wire. It's uh, for about a hundred feet. It's about four dollars. Paper clips work. Um, if you can hit a, I've I've seen folks get the um, the Christmas ball hangers, the ornament hangers. A lot of times you can catch a really good sale after Christmas. And uh, the the better price you can find on stuff, 
the better off you'll be. So I've just made pretty much a long S hook. I'm going to show you that again. We've got a piece of straight wire and we're just bending it around our wire cutters and then the opposite side and that's just me. It doesn't have to be on the opposite side. And there you go. Okay. And then I am going to use a pre-existing one of these that's already got some gunk on it. I try and recycle as best as I can. Um, so that's why I've got a box full of this stuff. Because even after you get junk and clear coat on one side, you can kind of clip off the side that's got junk on it. And then you've got your drip wire, which is the wire that hangs off the tail eyelet on your bait. Okay, so before we even open this, the less time that you spend with this open, the better off you're going to be. Um, reason being is oxygen affects how the chemical compound performs and consistency. You want this to stay thin. I, I've never and hopefully will never have to add thinner or anything to this. Um, KBS is perfectly created to work as it's made. Um, again if you have any kind of chemical including you know oxygen and the things of that nature their chemicals as well so anything that changes the composition of this is going to affect how this performs uh, people ask the one of the most common questions oh, I've got bubbles all over it well somehow the the chemical makeup of this has changed be it uh, loosely fitting top that's allowed oxygen to get in underneath or if you've used paint that's not completely dry or some people put glitter on with um, and I've done this before too but you really got to dry the crap out of it um, glitter like this anything that you dip this into and, and I always try and brush my clear coat onto anything that I've used now because it's different chemicals so, just extra little tip for the day. I know I'm being long-winded, but I, I cannot tell you enough how important it is to keep this as it was made and not lose the integrity of the chemical balance in this. We're just going to add the wire. And one thing that I've learned to do the hard way, everything usually is the hard way, it's trial by fire, over a period of time is to kind of crimp the ends of this together so that when you dip this this doesn't get loose and kind of swing and pop up off of the the wire because what's happened to me before and it's just it's just a pain in the butt and you end up getting your hands messy is when you dip this in like this a lot of times that'll float up because these are made to float anything that's, that's lighter than this is going to float Okay, so now these aren't going anywhere. Now on this, because of what it is, these things are a little tricky to get the drip wires in after the bait has been dipped. Most of the time if I'm doing square bills or S cranks or jerk baits or anything that's got that tail eyelet in it, um, I'll wait until after I dip the bait to put that on, not on wake baits. I put the uh, drip wire on prior to dipping. Turn that bait upside down because we want to kind of make sure that this stays on too. I don't even like to lose the drip wires or anything metal in here. I'm, I'm real touchy about this KBS. Okay, I think we're set. Again, spend as little time with this open as possible. See that seal? <laughs> when it's a good seal, that's going to stick right to it. So now we are ready to clear coat. I'm going to move this around to where you can hopefully see it a little bit better. Um, a lot of people ask about this. Does, does uh, the clear coat load onto it? Nope, and I'm going to show you how I kind of alleviate that build up. We're going to dip it for a couple seconds and you saw that I dipped it real slow. That also keeps bubbles off of this stuff. 
and then we're gonna let it drain you see how it's floating up at an angle super cool you want that to happen because what it's doing is it's draining all that excess KBS fluid clear coat off of the edge of this wake bait and then you can kind of hang that lip on the other side get it even and then pull it out put it right on here to, to dry. We're going to do this with the next bait. Again, don't, uh, don't push this in fast. It will create extra bubbles. And if you notice any bubbles around the eyes that don't come off once you've got your bait back out of the solution, what I can do, and hang on, let me get that excess off and the other way just let it drain it's not hurting anything but if you do notice any sort of bubble build up around your eyes like I said I keep a box of these pretty handy matter of fact I could even use the one little piece that we cut off and you can just go in here and pop bubbles and that's that's really going to help in the long run so now we have these beautiful gillies. That's going to dry for 24 hours. So today is Saturday. Those knuckleheads will be ready to ship on Monday. And I thank you guys for watching. Please leave your comments and your questions. We've run a little bit long on this. I was just going to show you the, the different types of uh, materials that you can use to layer patterns on your baits. Um, but I kind of wanted to do a start to finish on this from that point so thanks for hanging out with me i really appreciate it please leave me comments questions um tell me what you want to see next uh, i think i owe you guys a uh, stencil cutting video that is going to be in the works i've got a few more to upload in the meantime you guys have a great weekend happy fishing happy casting and we'll see you on the water